Welcome, friends, to worship here at Wesley Memorial Church in High Point, North Carolina. We consider it a great privilege that you take time to worship with us on the Lord's Day. During the summer months, we are going to be studying together the foundational truths of the Christian faith. Every Sunday in traditional worship at Wesley Memorial Church, we turn and face the cross and we declare what we believe based on the scriptures and the faith of the early Christian community. And we're going to be talking about those core convictions of the Christian creed during the summer months. And we hope that you'll join us and be part of this time of worship and learning together. What we believe makes us who we are. Again, thank you for sharing in this time of worship with us today. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, give us the increase of faith, hope, and love and that we may obtain what you have promised. Make us love what you command. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. When 
truth and justice reign, and Christ shall rule victorious all the world's domain. Our scripture today comes from the book of Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Will you pray with me? O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This summer here at Wesley Memorial, we've been exploring our faith by focusing in on various statements made through the Apostles' Creed. Until now, much of the Creed is focused on the beliefs we hold about the Trinitarian God, what we believe about God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. Today, however, we focus on two statements that we believe in the communion of the saints and the Holy Catholic Church. And this marks an important shift in the creed. These statements move from our belief in who God is to our belief in who we are in light of who God is. This is potentially very complicated territory, not because it's a difficult concept to understand, but because we're not so much talking about God's nature as we are about human nature. When we talk about the church, we are not talking about a kind of philosophical treatise that we have to analyze and and understand, like how God can be three in one, how Christ can be both fully human and fully divine. When we talk about the church, we're talking about one another. And honestly, speaking only for myself, humans can be a bit more unpredictable and even illogical at times. Gandhi once famously said when he was asked his thoughts about Christianity, I like your Christ, but not your Christianity. And we may all know people who are quick to distance themselves from the formality of an institution like the church, who may also say they are spiritual, but not religious. These kind of statements signal the ease with which many people like to talk and to think about Jesus but they have more than a few misgivings about the church. And yet, God established his church as the central and the most common way that he continues to reveal himself to the world. We read in the Gospels that Christ said to Peter, his disciple, that Peter would be his rock, and upon him he would build the church. Later in Acts, we read of the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came down from heaven onto a gathered crowd like tongues of fire, when Peter was preaching to them of the good news of Jesus. There thousands were converted, leading to the conclusion of that chapter when we read the church was growing day by day, when they spent time in the temple, and they broke bread together, and they praised God. This event marks the birth of the church. And we continue these practices and this gathering to this day, meeting on Sundays or throughout the week, meeting in various ways to go to church together. So what do we even mean when we say church? It can be a bit hard to pin down. The book of Acts described the basics of gathering together, praising God, breaking bread. The United Methodist Church has a more formal explanation and defines the church as a community of true believers under the lordship of Christ, where the word of God is proclaimed and the sacraments duly administered. And many of you may know a familiar song that tells us that the church is not a building, the church is not a steeple, the church is not a resting place, the church is the people, 
You know how it goes. I am the church. You are the church. We are the church. Together, all who follow Jesus all around the world, yes, we're the church together. And there's nothing wrong with any of these, written or sung. But if we go back to the Apostles' Creed, we find a few brief but very important starting points. When we recite the Apostles' Creed, we say of the church that we believe in the Holy Catholic Church. Two adjectives, holy and Catholic, with a small c meaning universal, that help us articulate the distinctive nature of the church. These two characteristics set the church apart from other kinds of gatherings and groups that are a part of our lives, and they set the bar quite high. To claim that the church is holy is to say that it's without blame, that it's a perfect institution, but I don't have to look much further than myself to say that there are some disqualified individuals here. It reminds me of when Groucho Marx left an organization and he said he wouldn't want to be a part of any club that would have him as a member. I assure you, we cannot call any church holy that has me as a member. Holiness is a high standard. And yet, we believe the church is holy not because of our faithfulness to God, but because of God's faithfulness to us. This is the story of God's people throughout all of Scripture. God called Abraham to be set apart, that Israel would be the family of God who would reveal God's love to the world, and time after time again, Israel strays and wanders far from their faithfulness to God. The prophets of the Old Testament spoke of God's ways and revealed His ways to the world, and yet many were reluctant, like Jonah and Jeremiah. And even Peter, not long after Christ had said that he would build his church upon him, on the day of Christ's crucifixion, Peter denied him three times. As Christ's church, we are this same set-apart community. At times, having and showing great faith. And at times, in need of a whole lot more. But always, the community that God continues to choose as the most common and consistent channel of his grace and spreading his love to a world in need of redemption. It's because we are Christ's church, not an institution of our own making, that we claim to be holy because Christ is holy. We go on to say that in addition to being holy, we believe the church is Catholic, that is, that it's universal, that there's a unity to it that spans across geography and across cultural divides. And on the one hand, we know when we say this, we believe in the resurrection of Christ and that saying that is a distinctive and a specific claim that unites us as believers and followers of Christ regardless of other differences that we might have. Yet the reality is, finding that unity is difficult. The Apostle Paul in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, the letter to the church in Corinth, likely written only 50 years after Christ's death. Paul is already scolding the church members there who are creating factions based off of whether they claim to be followers of Paul or followers of another teacher, Apollos. Skip ahead to the year 1054, the Eastern Orthodox Church separates from the Catholic Church over a variety of theological differences, one of which being whether they would say in their creed that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father or from the Father and the Son. In 1517, Martin Luther posted his 95 theses on the door of the church in Wittenberg, sparking the Reformation, splitting the Protestant church apart from the Roman Catholic Church. Shortly thereafter, in 1536, King Henry VIII needed an annulment from Catherine of Aragon, so he just declared himself head of the Church of England, started his own. These tendencies towards disunity are not ancient history. A few years ago, I visited Tangier Island, a beautiful small island in the Chesapeake Bay off the coast of Virginia. Tangier is home to no more than 700 inhabitants. It takes up no more than half of a square mile and is home to two churches, one of which Swain Memorial United Methodist Church founded nearly 200 years ago and the New Testament congregation established in 1946 when a group of Swain Memorial Church members 
had irreconcilable differences and packed up and moved down the road. Unity is hard, and it's hardly the norm for the church. And yet, we confess and believe that we are, in fact, one body. John Wesley, the founder of the United Methodist Movement, was once commenting on the divisions he saw in England between different groups of Christians, and he remarked, though we cannot think alike, may we not love alike. May we not be of one heart, though we are not of one opinion. Without all, di- without all doubt, we may. Swain Memorial or Living Testament, Church of England or Roman Catholic, North American, South American, African, those who may look like us or not, who may or may not speak the same way or pray the same way, worship the same way, vote the same way. As the song goes, yes, in fact, we are the church together. Not because we are all the same, but because Jesus Christ is the same at all times and in all places. That's what we really mean when we say we believe in a Catholic church. That despite all that may separate us, the love of Christ unites us. We are all one in the family of God. This unity then extends further beyond geography and culture. It extends even back through time as well as we proclaim that we believe in the communion of the saints. Just as we believe that Christ unites us with Christians across various locations, it also unites us with the faithful from our own past as well. In a very formal way, there are those we may readily identify as saints by name, such as the disciples, who we call now Saint Matthew, Saint Mark, Saint John, Saint Luke, or Saint Paul, or historic heroes of the faith such as Saint Francis, Saint Teresa. To believe in the communion of these saints is to say that we believe their actions in the past and their continued faithfulness through their eternal life in heaven give us the strength for the journey of our own lives of faith today. And who doesn't benefit, for example, from hearing of how St. Teresa of Calcutta devoted her life to uplifting the poor, to bringing comfort to the thousands, and inspiring similar acts of charity and goodwill whose effects continue to be seen today. These are people whose examples are for us the love of Christ, the grace of of God, the power of the Holy Spirit that is alive and active and available to us today. This is what lies at the heart of what we believe when we say we believe in the church. We believe in a God who is always active in all of our lives, in your life and in mine, in the lives of our brothers and sisters all over the world today, yesterday, centuries gone by. We believe in each other that each of us can learn from one another about how to go about our lives and be prepared for the ups and the downs, for the joys and the struggles, for the days of difficulty and the days of great victory. God has given us each other through the church as a gift to say we go through this life together and God has given us all we need. This is the key point that the author of Hebrews is making in chapter 12, when in the first verse he writes that we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. What a wonderful phrase to consider, that around us is a cloud of witnesses to God's love and faithfulness. In the preceding chapter, chapter 11 of Hebrews, the author gives the context for who these witnesses are. He encourages readers to have the same faith that began at the beginning of humankind, the faith of Abel. He talks about the faith of Enoch, the faith of Noah. He reminds us of the faith of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, the faith of Sarah, the faith of Moses, the faith of Rahab and Gideon and Samson and David and Samuel and of the prophets and the men and women throughout Israel's history who lived exemplary lives of faith. And he concludes with an important transition which begins chapter 12 saying, therefore, therefore, we have all these incredible people who've had great faith and they came before you. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great 
cloud of witnesses. Since all those who came before us are still a part of our journey, since they are with us and around us, we run the race of faith with perseverance together with the saints and with one another and with the assurance of victory through Jesus Christ. Over the last few weeks, the Summer Olympic Games have been taking place in Tokyo. And some of the highlights of the past week have been track and field events. So it seems fitting that our scripture today focuses on a vision of faith as a race that we run. What do you picture in your mind when you hear this? The initial image we may have is that we're a sprinter running along the track as fast as we can towards the finish line. But given the context of the preceding chapter, what the author of Hebrews seems to be setting up is not an image of a single runner headed towards a line, but rather what we might today call a relay race, where we're running only one section of a larger effort. That's the critical, therefore, transition. The race didn't start with us. It began at the moment God created human beings in his image. And the saints before us have all run their race and have handed off the baton to those of us who've come after them. And we take the baton from our parents, from those who sit in front of us at church, for friends who may have invited us to come to worship for the first time, for the men and women in the city who lead the, commun- the children's programs or Bible studies or organize mission efforts to help. They all stand in a line and they run their race. And then we take the baton when it's our time. But here's the secret. Hebrews makes it clear that our goal isn't to run under our own strength. It isn't up to us to run this race by ourselves. We keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. And when we profess our belief in the church, we claim with a 2,000 plus year old confidence that although God could do it on his own, God has instead chosen to work through the church as the primary means of redeeming our world. It baffles and it humbles me, but it's the case. Here we are, despite ourselves. We believe in the church because we believe it continues to be the place where God gathers his people together to worship and to pray, to find ourselves in a long line of people whose successes and whose failures are all part of the great unfolding of God's plan for redemption. We believe the church is holy, not because of who we are, but because of who Christ is. We believe the church is Catholic, not because we are united in love, but because Christ has called us to be so. And we believe in the communion of the saints, not because we are anywhere near sainthood, but because we're trying to get out of our own way so the Holy Spirit can work to move us closer and closer each day to be more like Christ in all we say and think and do. And Christ has promised to meet us here each day in this church building or online or in our homes or in a parking lot, anywhere two or more are gathered because the church is a place where we can bring our brokenness and our sinfulness, and God will meet us with forgiveness and with reconciliation, where we welcome everyone in to hear the good news of Jesus Christ, and then the Holy Spirit sends us back out to be Christ's hands and feet in the world. And at the end of the day, we believe in the church because God still believes in us. And if God still believes in us, then what can't the church do for you for our city, for our country, for a world that is in need of the transforming and the saving love of Jesus Christ. He's got the whole world in his hand. He's got the whole world in his hand. He's got the whole world in his hand. He's got the whole world 
in his hand. He's got the woods and the waters in his hand. He's got the woods and the waters in his hand. He's got the sun and the moon right in his hand. He's got the whole world in his hand. <clears throat> He's got the birds and the bees right in his hand. He's got the birds and the bees right in his hand. He's got the beasts of the field right in his hand. He's got the whole world in his hand. He's got you and me right in his hand. He's got you and me right in his hand. He's got everybody in his hand. He's got the whole world in his hand. He's got the Thank you for worshiping with us today here at Wesley Memorial Church in High Point, North Carolina. We are grateful that you've joined us. On August the 22nd in our in-person worship, we'll be recognizing and honoring all the educators in our midst, from preschool through higher education, both active and retired, and we would love to have you join us. Again, thank you for worshiping with us. Now may the love of God and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you forever. Amen.